1 Timothy chapter 6. If you've been with us for a while, we've been going through 1 Timothy verse by verse. And uh, we've been after this thing for a couple of months now. And uh, even some of the verses that perhaps fly in the flight path of uh, what's popular, what's culturally acceptable, uh, we somehow have got through those verses and those truths and themes together. Uh, nobody has screamed, thrown anything at me from the audience, ran out of the auditorium screaming, uh, but we've uh, gone through this together. And we believe that God's Word is alive, it's active, it's for us, it's for our spiritual nourishment. And yes, there are things that are going to go cross grain with the culture that we live in. However, Scripture says that we're to fear God more than we're to fear man. Amen? I said we're to fear God more than we're to fear man. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gratuitous, but I'll take that. Uh, so 1 Timothy chapter 6 is where we are today. We're just going to be looking at two verses today. Sometimes we take just a big old bite, a whole big passage. Today we're just looking at two verses. If you were with us last week, we talked about how Christians are to relate to their most senior leaders who are elders. We've been talking about elders. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about how Christians are to relate to their bosses. Some of you are saying, you don't know my boss. You don't want to work for my boss. But today we're going to be talking about the practicalities for us as Christians in the secular workplace. And why is that important? What does that look like? Why don't you stand with me in reverence for the Word of God? And we're going to read these two verses together. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to Pastor Timothy. He is in his, his last season of ministry, spoiler alert, the Apostle Paul, and he is literally passing the baton forward to this young next generation pastor, uh, somebody he admires greatly, someone he is investing in pouring his life and wisdom into, uh, that he would run the next lap of faith. Here Paul continues to write, 1 Timothy all who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves." These are the things you are to teach and insist on. God bless you. You may be seated. Tomorrow morning, those of you who are, are working, when that alarm goes off, how many of you would say, I am going to jump out of bed with a smile, I am going to go into work, and I am going to whistle while I work? Yeah, yeah, that was kind of the response I was expecting. But the million dollar question is not so much if you're going to whistle while you work, is do you worship while you work? Sadly, many people don't. I, I like what someone said. He says, I always give 100% at work. 13% on Monday, 22% on Tuesday, 26% on Wednesday, 35% on Thursday, and 4% on Friday. I hope that's not you giving your 100%. I like the one about the, the sign that was in front of a store with big letters, no help wanted. Two buddies were passing by, one said to the other, you should go in there and apply, you'd be perfect for that. <laughs> Oscar Wilde, the great pay, uh, pray, uh, playwright, said that the best way to appreciate your job is to imagine yourself without one. It's true. It's true. Sometimes we take our jobs for, for granted, don't we? Sometimes, and especially in, a, in an unusual ebbs and flows and trajectories of economies and such like that, eh, sometimes we forget how blessed we are by employment. And whether you like your job or not, work is good. Some of you might have to just kind of say that through clenched teeth. Work is good. Say it with me. Work is good. Work is, is, is good. God gave man work to do before the fall. You ever think about that chronologically? Man, Adam in this case, was given work to do before the fall. In other words, it wasn't a result of the fall. It wasn't a curse on his life because of his disobedience. God gave him work to do in the garden, and it was enjoyable, and it was big, and it was a, a lot to do. 
But work is, is, is good. And we need to remember that we miss opportunities as Christians, and especially employed Christians, when we just kind of say, well, it's just, it's just work. It's a, more of a drudgery than a privilege or an opportunity. It's, uh, it's more of something that I have to do instead of something that I, I get to do. And sometimes, and I'm not just saying this about you, but sometimes all of us can sometimes get this selective amnesia and we can forget that, that your work matters to God. Your work matters to God. It is a, it's a gift from his gracious hand. And how you work, not so much if you work, but how you work matters greatly to him. So where do you work? Some of you might say, you know, since the whole COVID thing, I've, I've worked from home. I never thought I could do my job from home, but boy, we had to get pretty creative. We had to really utilize and maximize technology. I used to go to an office. I used to have a cubicle. I used to go to those places, and, and now I'm working from home. Or maybe you do go to an office. Maybe some of you work from the road. I'm looking at my friend Mark over here. Or maybe your work is on the road. Maybe you're a, a stay-at-home mom. Boy. You've got quite a job to fulfill. Where do you work? Where do you work? What's that like for you? Listen, whatever tasks God has for you to do within any given week, that is your work. And that, listen, friends, is your act of worship. It's your act of worship. Now, tomorrow tomorrow morning when your alarm goes off, 6.30, Uh, somehow you might not just automatically to default to, oh my goodness, I'm so excited, it's worship time. But instead, it's how we view our employment. It's how we view. Is your work a a, a have to or is it a get to? Is it something you're going to roll your eyes and think, oh my gosh. Back in the day, there used to be a punk rock band. Some of you who remember punk rock back in the day. There used to be a group that was led by Bob Geldof, later became very famous with, with Live Aid. And the name of his group was the Boomtown Rats. Anybody want to acknowledge they knew who the Boomtown Rats were? And their most famous song was, I Don't Like Mondays. <laughs> Some of your snooze buttons are going to get abused tomorrow. <laughs> You've, some of you have had an extra day because of Thanksgiving, and uh, you just rather just kind of sleep in. Some of you parlayed the extra time off from last week, and maybe I can just somehow squeeze a, a, another day out of that as well. But it's how you view your work. And, and I want you to not only see your work as tolerable, but I want you to see it through the lens of, of worship, that, that your work is is an act of worship. I believe, before we get into the text, and there's three points I do want you to excavate from the text, is we need to kind of clear up a few misunderstandings. The first misunderstanding is that worship is a Sunday thing. Worship is a, it's a Sunday thing, right? Didn't you come to worship today? Where are you going? Man, we never see your car at, at 10.30 in the morning on Sundays. Well, we go to, to worship. And yeah, that's why we're here today, and corporate worship is is super, super important. I was just reading devotionally in Hebrews today that as that day, Christ's coming is approaching, and it is approaching, friends, that we need to be meeting more and more together. Why? To encourage each other as that promised event comes. We need to do this. Corporate worship is important in the Bible. It's, It's important now. But this is not just worship encapsulated. Worship just doesn't happen in a place. It's not an event. It just doesn't happen between this time and this time. But worship is so much more than that. I want you to see this, that your life is an act of worship. Your, your very life is, a, is an act of worship. You, you don't take the day off. The real brunt, the real responsibility is how are you going to worship this coming week? I'm glad to see you today for corporate worship. Again, it's so, so very important. It's paramount. But by the same token, the gazillion dollar question is, how are you going to worship on Tuesday night? Next Thursday morning, how, 
how's your worship going to be? So worship is not just a, a Sunday thing. And when we talk about worship and your life being an act of worship, it's not just a, a Sunday thing. Your life is an act of worship. How do I know that? Because I read the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, everybody say, whatever. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of, of God. See, whatever I do for the glory of God. Friends, today, that's why you're on the planet. It's why you're breathing the air, is you're here for the glory of God. You're not here for your own glory. You're not here for the glory of anything other than God. Why? Because God is the highest value. And to give your best and to give your life to anything less than God is to waste your life. Some of you have been saying, man, I lived for me for a long period of time, or I lived for a possession, or I lived for a position, or I lived for this. And, and all I found is, man, I, yeah, I achieved it, but it was like, really? That, this is it? That's it? That's, that's what? I, I, I climbed on top of people to get? <laughs> that's what I burned ulcers to achieve? There's got to be something more. Somehow we know there's something more, don't we? Scripture tells us that God has, has put eternity in our hearts. There's stuff we know, and we have no idea why we know it. But we know that there's something above ourselves. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a great, great opportunity. Everybody, whether you know the Lord or don't, whether you go to church or you don't, everybody expresses and feels gratitude. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that there's something in you that needs to thank somebody and you don't know what it is. This is also proof of God, is the gratitude that you had. Now, I'm assuming on, on Thursday that you, you expressed your gratitude. You maybe got together with some family and friends. But isn't it amazing just to take one big step back and realize, man, the fact that I felt gratitude at all, there must be a target, there must be a personality, there must be something that I feel that for in which that needs to be directed. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and worship is, is one of those ways that, that we do that. I love Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as a working for the Lord, not for human masters. See, your life is an act of worship. And no matter what you do, you can turn it into worship. Isn't that amazing? Whatever it is. Well, that's so trivial. That really, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. It's not going to show up in my diary ledger tonight. It's just kind of what I do. It's kind of a trivial thing. And yet everything that we do can become an act of worship. We can never, ever forget that, including, listen, friends, work. And so, worship is a Sunday thing, is a, a big misunderstanding, and sadly, some of us have, have bought that in the church. Here's the second misunderstanding, is that work and church are two separate things. There might be somebody here today or watching online, and you say, man, you know what, I love the Lord, I'm here, I'm so glad to be in church on this weekend, and, and this is awesome that we can come together and we can do this, but tomorrow, the demands of my job are going to pull on certain places in my heart and in my character that aren't exactly Christian. See, you don't know what I do, Steve, but, but man, I have to kind of stick it to that guy before anybody else. I have to be ultra competitive, and, and it really doesn't matter if it kind of isn't the most honest thing, but you know what? It, it keeps the, the food on the table. Sometimes we want to segregate, we want to separate our, our, our church life, our Christian life, from, from our work life. You know what? I want to stay employed. This is a good job, man. I, I got my dream job, and you recognize, man, there is a tension, there is a tug of war between my life that I want to live for Jesus and the life that keeps me employed. Some of you may be in that situation, or you recognize that, hey, Steve, don't mix those two things up. Hey, hey, Steve, those are two different gears that I have to shift into during the week. Let me remind you today, because it's so vitally important, that you are a Christian and an ambassador 24-7. You are a Christian and an ambassador. You can't set your Sunday side and be somebody else. 
You can't do that. On the cross, Jesus died for all of you. And that's the, the, what he wants from you. I want all of you. I want your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want, I want all of you. I'm not going to settle. I, I, you, I'm not going to settle for a, a, a pieced out part of you. I'm not going to settle for just the convenient part you want to surrender to me. I'm Lord. If I'm not Lord of all, I'm what? I'm not Lord at all. And if you're going to call on me as Lord, that means that, that I see it all, and it's all in the light, and it all belongs to me. And so therefore, don't. Don't, don't separate these things. See, work and church are not two separate things. You are a Christian, and you are an ambassador. How about that? Some of you would say, man, that is a, that's a tall order to fill. Really? Representing Jesus of all personalities in history? Jesus in the world and in my workplace? You should see what it's like in my workplace. Yes. That's what God has called you to be. He's called you to be light in dark places. Now, I say this not because I read a book or because I just kind of cherry-picked some verses, but I started working at 15 years old. I'm one of those guys who didn't go straight from public high school here in Tampa right into Bible college. Uh, Some people did, and that's an awesome thing, but I didn't know even what I was supposed to do with my life until I was 30 years old. I worked in the secular workplace, and so I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be the only Christian in a workplace, in an office. I know what that's like. I know what it's like to, to, to want to represent Jesus so much, to have this kind of connection with him on Sunday, and, and then to commute into work and knowing, man, I'm going into the lion's den <laughs> right now. I know what that's like. And so it's important that we recognize, man, in order for me to make any kind of inroads with my, my unsaved friends, my unsaved supervisors, that means I've got to be consistent. That means I've got to take my ambassadorship for Jesus really, really seriously. And so how? How do you worship while you work? It's interesting that in our text today, only it's two verses, one is directed towards working for unbelieving bosses, and the other one is how you are to relate, fellow Christian, to believing bosses. I would probably just kind of spitball and say that probably most of you work. And again, it might be different for you. And Praise God if it isn't that you work for, for unbelieving bosses out there. But here's the first thing, the practical way that you and I can worship while we work. Some of you are saying, does that mean I bring a boom box with my, you know, Hillsong, uh, you know, do I stop two times an hour, you know, set my alarm and just stop and pray? Yeah, 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 there's a line waiting for their coffee orders, but you know what, I got to stop and I got to work. Don't, don't hear something I'm not saying. Here's the first thing is be grateful. Be grateful. You have a grateful heart. Are you grateful that you're employed? Should we be grateful? Yeah, I get it. I get it that that, that when that snooze button is just getting worn out, I get you, man. But the, the reality is, man, I'm employed. God's given me something to, to do, something that's worthwhile, something that is going to use my, the physical me, something that's going to tap into my aptitude, something, that, something that's going to pay the bill, something that's going to keep the, the light on, something that, that I should be thankful to him for. God's given me an opportunity to, to stretch my faith. Again, oftentimes we're working in environments where not everybody knows Jesus the way that you do. Matter of fact, it's a blessing because it's a, a day-to-day, or at least most likely five days a week, if you're a full-time employee, of a diagnostic of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. <sighs> Boy, it's hard working with so-and-so. Man, I, what's that mean? Lord, I need, I need more, more of you to pour into my patience bucket. <laughs> God, it's hard to love these people. They make fun of me because they know I'm a, a, a person who, who loves the Lord. Man, I need more love in my life. How about self-control? Yeah, man, I just want, sometimes I just want to retaliate when they're maybe making fun or poking at me just because I, I believe in this God that I can't see. I need some self-control, Lord. And so we see that it's a blessing. We can thank God 
not just for the employment, but, but that God is growing us spiritually. He's stretching our faith. And one of the ways he does that in very, very well is in the workplace. There we get to a lab. You know, Sunday morning, is, is, I just kind of do this, a 60-year-old man kind of walking around and waving his arms and perspiring for you. Um, it's kind of like a lecture, you know? How many of you, you, you like that in high school and, and, and you went to college or maybe some of you were in graduate school and, and there was that time and it's like, okay, you know, yeah, I got I to gotta listen to this person and they're going to lecture. But it was really, really cool when you got a lab connected with it, right? Okay, droning, droning, droning. But then you get to go into the lab and you get to actually put those things in practice. I kind of see this that way when it comes to worshiping while we work. This is kind of the lecture. I'm giving you principles. I'm sharing with you truths from God's word, eternal truths. And yet tomorrow or whenever you go into the workplace and you clock in, that's, that's the lab, man. That's when you realize. That's when the test tubes come out. That's when you dissect that frog. That's, why, that's when you do those things. It's, it's hands-on and it's practical. And work is the way that we take the, the theoretical, we take the truths of God and we, and we actually put epidermis on it. We make it somehow real and, and work it and we get to test it. So important. Be grateful. Here's the second way that you can worship is let your light shine. Let your light shine. Now what's interesting here is Paul is talking about a a subject that, frankly, we don't like talking about, but that's slavery, right? And Paul, in many of his letters here, because slavery was part of, of that ancient world, Paul here was, is giving practicalities. It was a reality in his day. And so he was teaching believers how to, how to live and act in such a world. But I also think it's noteworthy that, that the Bible also paved the way for the elimination of slavery. Oftentimes we don't talk about that, but it was in those cultures that believed and stood on unswervingly biblical principles that that slavery began to decline and ultimately disappear. See, you can't endorse slavery, you can't embrace slavery and and read the golden rule, can you? You you can't be in a world where slavery is the norm and and believe, Genesis 127, that we're all made in the image of, of God that there is a brotherhood of believers. And so it's in those atmospheres, it's in those societies that, that the Bible, again, just for those societies that stood on biblical principles, they're the, they're the ones in which slavery did eventually, thank you, Lord, disappear. But notice what he's saying there is he's talking about a Christian working for an unbelieving boss. He says, consider your masters worthy of full respect. Paul, my boss is a jerk. My boss thinks it's I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puss for going to church and giving what? Ten? Ten percent? Are you kidding me? Here Paul says to Christians who, who work for unbelieving bosses, to treat them with respect, to, 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 to go to them and to, and to treat them with the, the respect of the job. And, but I love where Paul will give you that so that. See, it's not just Paul saying, do this, do this, do this. How do you do this? But the whys. How many of you could say, man, if I understand the whys, then I can, I can push through anything. He said, man, even for your bosses that are unbelievers, he says, do that, do that, do that. Why, Paul? So that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. How about that? You know what? You're going to suffer a little bit. Not everybody's going to give you milk and cookies. But the important thing to remember, and so importantly, is that you represent God and the church to a watching and listening world. You don't know when you're being watched. You have no idea. You have no idea. I remember years ago, and I'm, I'm going I'm to say this because God's putting it on my heart right now. Rick Atkinson, somebody I adore as a brother, respect to the hilt. I remember years ago, before we went to Bible college, Rick, you may remember this. You came up to me, and you said, Steve, I've been watching you. 
And he grew up, Rick grew up in faith. Parents, legendary. Bible school teachers, Norma, everything. But Rick told me, and this was right before I went to Johnson Bible College. Rick said, I've been watching you. I didn't ask Rick to watch me. And, and, and after he said that, I thought, oh, my gosh. What if he'd have seen me in my, in my worst parts? See, but that was the thing. He did see me in my worst parts. And he saw how God was able to just kind of pull me out of the, the mire and the clay and, and put my feet on a rock and put a new song in my mouth. And I didn't do it perfectly, but I remember Rick saying that that inspired him. And Wow. No, he was watching. Some of you think, oh, man, well, it's just the people who get up here on Sunday and have a microphone on their face or sing the songs and all that. They're the only ones being watched because they're just in this visible place. No. No, you're being watched. You're being listened to. Why? Because, again, everybody knows there's something more. They just won't admit it. And they want to know your sincerity in that. You don't have to be perfect. Isn't that good news? But you do need to be sincere. You do need to try. And so it's so, so very, very important of letting your light shine. Again, people are watching you. They're listening to you. Titus 2, 9 through 10. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. And again, even though your boss may be extremely trying, work hard. Even though your boss may not believe anything that your life is about, show up on time. Show up on time. Though your boss may not understand your life and the decisions that you make, follow the instructions. Don't disrespect them. Prove that you're trustworthy. Don't steal. I thought this was interesting. I thought this was sad. I pulled up this this research a couple of weeks ago. Recent studies show that 5.8% falsely use or or, or alter their timesheets, their time. 6.6% steal merchandise. 57% abuse their employee discount privileges. Could that be why Paul said, don't steal? Don't steal from them. I love what St. Francis of Assisi said. Preach the gospel all the time. And if necessary, use words. Friends, as an employee, no matter what that is, whether it's a stay-at-home mom, whether it's a full-time employee, whether you are on the bottom of the, of the pecking list or you are a supervisor, whatever that looks like, is you are a preaching a sermon every single day. And it's by your discipline. It's by your attitude. It's by your actions. It's by your priori- priorities, what you will do and what you refuse to do. Why? Because you're doing it all for the glory of God. Here's the last thing. Here's the last way that we worship while we work, is do good work while you work. Do good work while you work. Paul says that those who have believing masters, okay, now he's shifting from the unbelieving master to the believing master. Some of you do know what that's like, to have a, a, a Christian boss or someone who, who is empathetic to your faith. Or, those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they're fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. Friends, don't take advantage of fellow Christians. Don't take advantage of fellow Christians. Well, you know what? My, my boss is a Christian, so he won't. it doesn't matter if I come in a little bit late. Well, my boss is a Christian. She doesn't mind if I, if I don't meet my quota. Like, they're, they're fellow believers. I go to church with them. Friends, why should that not happen? Simply because of this. They're my family. They're my family. And you don't do that to family. 
you don't do that to family. So don't take advantage. Now, some of us, and I think it's prudent of us, some of us know that some of us are in, in different things. Jeff Atkins knows a lot about vehicles. I know nothing about vehicles. I got, I got ripped off last year. I was 100 bucks because I needed my blinker fluid replaced. It's an old joke. Of course, I know there's not blinker fluid. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> muffler bearing, is that what it is? <laughs> but Jeff knows a lot about cars. And so that's an awesome thing. That's an awesome thing. And we do need to know each other. We do can network a little bit. But listen, we don't take advantage. Well, you know what? He's a great guy, you know, that old, that old Wade there. You know, I'll, I, I need some stonework done. Eh, he, he won't charge me. He's, he's a member of the church. No. Here Paul is saying, man, if you're in this situation with fellow believers, treat them right. Treat them with respect. Do better, he says, because they're fellow believers, because they have a mutual faith and a heart that wants to bless you and to help you and to take care of you. I end with this, Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. I love this so much. Solomon writes, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you are going, kind of a bummer, right? In the realm of the dead, where you're going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Solomon, what are you telling us? Someday, your work here will end. I was expecting big amens with that part. <laughs> Someday, your work here is done. Whatever you do, no need for that any, any longer. But in the meantime, in the meantime, view it and treat it as a blessing. Whatever it is, whatever it is, do it well. Do it right. Do it as unto God himself. Do it with your heart, your soul, your might, your strength. Do it the right way. And do it all for the glory of, of God. And if you'll do those things, you'll worship while you work. As I've been thinking a lot about working and working and working, you know, most of us don't do our work pro bono, do we? Typically, there is a wage, there's a salary, and it's what is due for whatever our labor is. What's interesting is where Paul tells us elsewhere that the wages of sin is death. It's your paycheck. It's what your transgressions and my transgressions deserve. The wages of sin is death. What does that mean? Well, that means, that means physical separation. That means spiritual separation from God. That means absolute death. That means absolute hopelessness with no chance of second chances. That's a big deal. When I think about work, I think about how sometimes, yes, we come to Christ by faith, and somewhere along the line, now it's all on us to work out our own salvation with, with work, with, with efforts. And you can't get this many people together and, and have some people say, you know what, I'm, I'm working for my salvation. I know Jesus is a big deal. I know, I, he's, yeah, I know all these things about Jesus, but... But it's Jesus and me. It's not Jesus alone. It's grace alone. It's, it's grace and work. It's the cross and my exertions. It's Jesus and me. And yet the Bible says it's something totally different than that. You know, I grew up thinking that way. I grew up thinking that way. That is all based. Man, I was a good church boy. You know, you can be a good church boy and not be in Jesus Christ. Perfect Sunday school attendance. Knew a lot about Jesus. Let's play Bible trivia. I'll beat you. Gave my allowance to the Lord. 
You can be in church and not be in Christ. I grew up with this self-inflated sense of pride because I was doing it right. I was taught to do it right. The way that our church believed, it was, it's done this way, you do it perfectly, you do this, you don't do this. And it's all based on you. Here's the problem with that. I had no joy in my life. When you grow up that way, and it's all about rules and regulations and, 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 and stringent borders, here's the thing, is every night when you go to sleep, you have no joy. All you do is rewind the day of how you messed up. And then one day, and it wasn't even in a good place in my life. It was a valley place in my life. And I came to this congregation. John, your dad, may have been the preacher that day. And he said, it's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. And it changed me. A, a, a light. And it wasn't just a little twinkle. It was a, it was a floodlight in my face that I was making it all about me and my performance. Look at God. Look at how good I am compared to the rest of these folks. I was a Pharisee. And God in his mercy, aren't you glad God's got mercy? God saw me in that place of self-deception, even in that place of pride. And those words cut through me and I recognize man it's not about what you do Steve that's why you don't live with joy because you mess it up all the time there's stuff you want to do that you don't do there's stuff you do that you don't want to do but then that preacher that day I think it was your dad John said it's not about you guys God doesn't love you based on your performance it's about what he's already done. That when Jesus Christ was suspended on that cross between heaven and earth, that scandalous Friday, outside the walls of Jerusalem, when he said, it's finished, it was. He did it perfectly. He did it once. He did it for all. And I had to repent that Sunday. I had to get down and just, and weeping, I said, Lord, forgive me for making what you did all about me when it's all about grace. And that's when I got joy in my life. Some of you don't have joy because you're putting so much pressure on yourself. Well, I've got to do this, and 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 I know I need to be doing this, but I'm not doing this, and I don't want to do this, but I keep doing this. And, and Stop! The good news is it's done. And he did it perfectly. And our hope is in him. And then, only then can you live with joy. He's the one who paid it all. And he did it right, and he did it once, and he did it completely, and he did it for you. That's why it's good news. There might be somebody here today, and I'm just spitballing, as we've been talking about working, 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 and you've made your salvation, you've placed your hope in you. That's a bucket with a hole at the bottom, guys. You're never going to live in the joy of the Lord. You're never going to live in the joy of your salvation if you're making it all about you and your performance. Here's the bottom line. We're all messed up. You're never going to be good enough. There was one. There was one. He did it perfectly for you. Have you put your faith in him? Have you put your faith in him? Have you called out on his name? It's the most important news I can give you. It's a proclamation that Jesus did it all, and he did it for you. And he's offering you a gift today. He's offering you a free gift 
and he laid down his life to give you. What an insult to refuse him. There's somebody here today, and, and you're not living in the joy of your salvation. If you're living, just beating yourself up. Would you receive the, the mercy and the grace of Jesus today? Sam's about to lead us in a song. It's a song we all know. It's a song from our heritage. It's... When we all just stop and recognize <sighs> Jesus did it all. Would you put your faith in Jesus today? Maybe some of you have been drifting. Come back. Come home. I had to make a, a radical course adjustment that Sunday. Maybe today, God's knocking on the door of your heart saying, you know what, it's time to make a radical course adjustment with your life. Maybe you've been drifting. Well, Steve, I'm here every Sunday. I always sit in the same section. You know what? You can sit in the same section every single Lord's Day, and you can be drifting. Come back. Come home. Maybe there's somebody here today saying, man, I, I need a church family. I need a church family that will love me and hang with me that has mercy. <laughs> Again, we're all a mess. We're all a mess here. But God loves us anyway. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus. If the Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of your heart, answer it. I had to answer the door. I haven't done it perfectly, guys. I still don't do it perfectly. I promise you that. But my hope is no longer in whether I preach good enough sermons. My hope is in what Jesus Christ did for me and what he's done for you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you today. Father, I pray that our lights would shine in the workplace. Not that we're a bunch of goody two-shoes, fuddy-duddy, weirdo people. But that we just love our bosses, our supervisors, our fellow employees, Lord, just with the love of Jesus. Father, I pray if there's someone here today that's just beating themselves up. Father, I just pray that they would rest and they'd put their faith completely in what you have accomplished for our benefit. Thank you, Father, that you know our hearts. Thank you that you know where we are right now. And God, we're just asking you to move. Father, destroy our pride. And like the prodigal son, help us to refuse to live in a faraway land one minute longer. For your name, we live. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen.